of that. Today is a great day to be a contemporary preacher. You know why? Because I could have come with shorts and a t-shirt and flip-flops, but <laughs> that's not us. So one of the pastors asked me before Sunday school, he said, you know, we really need to change our dress code on days like this. But um, we'll pray about that, but I'm sure God will say no. All right. <laughs> I love America. I trust you do as well. Um, somebody told me the other day that there were, I think they said 8,000 um, citizens last year that moved to other nations and renounced their American citizenship. And um, probably mostly because of tax purposes and they moved someplace that didn't have an income tax. But, you know, it's. It's sad to think that someone would leave America um, and renounce their citizenship because we do live in a great nation. Um, and it's great, and we'll look at that this morning, because of what it stands for and what it has stood for, maybe I should say, through the years. Um, I love Fayetteville as well. I know many people don't like Fayetteville. Um, I've been here 23 years. and. Um, a lot of people come through and they don't um, like Fayetteville a whole lot. Uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, when you drive down the same street and have two or three different names for the same road, it makes it a little difficult to get around um, and give directions to folks. Um, the, the traffic light system's getting better over the years, but it's a little difficult to try to get the right traffic pattern down. and and uh, get through things. Um, I mentioned in the early service, and John Bolt told me, you know, he said, let's see, how do you word it? He said, green means go, yellow means go faster, <laughs> and red means you can get three more through before anybody really stops. <laughs> so that, that's about right. So you don't ever pull out on a green light. You sit and wait and make sure everything's clear so you don't get hit. But, um, but I do love America, I love faith, but I appreciate the, the military and the sacrifices that so many have made in the presence of our military in our town. Um, and it is a joy to, to be in, a, in an area where there is such um, a presence. And, you know, it's interesting, as Pastor Dwayne said earlier, God is good all the time. Amen. And whether there's good times or bad times, God is still good. Job said, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And um, I know often we feel that we are under pressure and that we have many negative things in our lives. But you know, I was um, reading in 2 Corinthians the other day morning, and you know, after all that Paul went through in his life, he, made, he, he makes the comment that it's just a light affliction. And think about that. You know, at the end of, or near the end of Paul's life, he says, everything that I've suffered for the cause of Christ is just a light affliction. And he said, I can't wait to get to heaven where then I'll be blessed. And then I'll, 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 I'll receive much, much more. And so, yes, we struggle. Our nation struggles. We have problems. Our churches, our families, and our own personal lives. But through it all, God is still good because it's his nature to be good. America is great only for the purpose that God is great and that God has allowed America to be great. And in, in my message this morning, I'm going to look at an Old Testament story. And I want us to, to realize that even though we're looking at the nation of Israel, even though we're looking at something in the Old Testament, we, we still realize that history repeats itself. And we can study history, we can look at other nations that have gone before us, and we can look at the cycles that they've gone through and what they've experienced and realize, you know what, if, if this nation and so many after it have followed the same cycle, chances are our nation or any other nation that follows the same cycle will have the same result. And so we're going to look back um, at, a, at a, a narrative from Second Chronicles, but before we do that, um, someone sent me um, some time back um, seven little things about only in America. And I thought they were, were cute and in, 
Uh, some of them were even funny, so I thought I'd share them with you this morning. But only in America can a pizza get to your house faster than an ambulance. <laughs> and Cumberland County's really work, they've, they've really done a lot of work on the EMTs. If you follow the, the news reports and the newspaper articles, they're, they're, they've really put some things in place to try to help that and do better. But um, only in America are there handicapped parking places in front of a skating rink. <laughs> only in America do people order double cheeseburgers, I'm sure you can finish this one, large fries and a Diet Coke. Yep. <laughs> only in America do we leave cars worth thousands of dollars in the driveway and put all of our junk in the garage. Only in America do we use caller ID to screen calls and have call waiting so we won't miss a call from someone we didn't want to talk to in the first place. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? And then only in America do we buy hot dogs in packages of 10 and buns in packages of 8. <laughs> so somebody always has to eat one without the bun. All right. But um, George Carlin, another thing that I wanted to, to share with you, uh, George Carlin wrote a, um, a little, it's not really a poem, but a, a statement called The Paradox of Our Time. And it, it kind of reflects a, maybe a little bit on the more of the sad part or the, the dreary part of America. And I don't want this necessarily to be a dreary sermon, um, but I think we need to get a proper perspective. And he says, the paradox of our time in history is that we have taller buildings but shorter tempers, Wider freeways, but narrower viewpoints. We spend more, but have less. We buy more, but enjoy less. We have bigger houses and smaller families. More conveniences, but less time. We have more degrees, but less sense. More knowledge, but less judgment. More experts, yet more problems. More medicine, but less wellness. We spend too recklessly, laugh too little drive too fast, get too angry, stay up too late, get up too tired, read too little, watch TV too much, and pray too seldom. We have multiplied our possessions, but reduced our values. We talk too much, love too seldom, and hate too often. We've learned how to make a living, but not a life. We've added years to life, but not life to years. We've been all the way to the moon and back, but we have trouble crossing the street to meet a new neighbor. We've done larger things, but not better things. We've cleaned up the air, but polluted our soul. We've conquered the atom, but not our prejudices. We write more, but learn less. We plan more, but accomplish less. We've learned to rush, but not to wait. We build more computers to hold more information, to produce more copies than ever, but we communicate less and less. And um, a lot of truth there, that as, even as believers, we really need to take note of some of that and realize that there is such a great opportunity to pray more. And um, Dick Button brought to our attention a call to fall, and it, we put it on the front of your prayer sheet this morning. And um, we, we signed up to do this today, and at the end of the service, we're going to take just a few minutes to pray for our nation. And um, part of my sermon this morning um, is directed towards this, of, of lifting our nation up in prayer. And really it starts with us as individuals. And um, as we know from 2 Corinthians 7, 14, it's so important that we humble ourselves, that we confess our sin, that we confess the sins of our nation, our people, and then we ask God to forgive us and to heal our land. And so at the end of the service this morning, we'll take just a few minutes of have some quiet prayer and um, close in prayer, praying for our nation. But um, as we go through life, one of the things that we hear so often is the question, why? Um, I pulled an article out of the paper this morning, if you've kept up with the news, about the school bus driver that was um, harassed by four young students on her bus. and. Um, they ended up, they've, um, the four seventh graders, and they have suspended them from riding the bus for a year, and they asked the woman, the, the bus driver, if she was happy with that, and she said yes, that she was, and then her statement was, I want to ask them why they did it. 
You know, and isn't that, I mean, that's, that's very natural. Um, so often when something happens or, you know, even from a child, I can remember as a, a young boy growing up asking my dad all, you know, just the, the whys of everything. You know, you get in the car and, you know, Dad, why are, you know, why, does, why are you pushing that pedal and why do you push that and why do you move the gear stick and, you know, why, why, why? You know, and he would try to explain all these things and then God blessed me with children and I had one that was the same, very inquisitive, always asking why to the point where you finally got down to the point where you didn't really have any other answers other than, I don't know, that's just the way it goes. <laughs> Um, that was kind of the end. I, I, I kind of ran out of solutions or, or explanations for that. But, but we like to ask questions. It's in our nature to ask questions. And, and I think often it's because we do want to learn. We want to understand. You know, when our children do wrong, what do we say? We say, why did you do that? You know, why did you disobey? And, and we're trying to understand and see from their perspective, you know, what the reasoning was so that we can try and help maybe change their thoughts or fill in some blanks, give them a different perspective. You know, the, probably the most difficult thing to deal with is when you ask someone why and they say, I don't know. Well, you know, and we feel what, the, the frustration is, well, I can't help you if I don't know why. I, ca I can't do anything about it if I'm not, sh if I don't know what caused the behavior. And, and so why is a very important question to ask. Because we want to make a difference, we want to make a change, we want to be able to look at something and say, you know what, why did God bring judgment upon Israel? All right, and once we figure out why, then we can reflect and say, all right, so then this is what needs to change so that God's judgment doesn't come upon America or come upon me as an individual. And so it's important to ask the question, why? And this morning I want to speak to you on why America and I want to use this, the um, narrative that we find in Second Chronicles, chapter 17 through 20. Now, no, don't get don't get too excited because we won't cover all of that this morning. Um, I'm going to speak this morning on chapter 17 and 18. Please come back tonight because we will finish the narrative tonight in chapters 19 and 20. And there's a great breaking point at the end of chapter 18, um, and you will see that as we conclude this evening. But in Chapter 17, starting in verse 3, um, the scripture says, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat, because he walked in the first ways of his father David, and sought not unto Balaam, but sought to the Lord God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not after the doings of Israel. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents, and he had riches and honor and abundance. And his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord, Moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. Also in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, even to Ben-Hale and to Obadiah and to Zechariah and to Nethaniel and to Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, even Shemaiah and Nethaniah and Zebediah and Asahel and Shemaramoth and Jehonathan and Adonijah and Tobijah and Tob Adonijah, Levites, with them Elishama and Jehoram, priests. And they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them and went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were round about Judah so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. And some, I'm sorry, um, and some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents and tribute silver, and the Arabians brought him flocks, 7,700 rams and 7,700 he goats. So we, we get a picture here of what's going on in the life of Israel and in the life of Jehoshaphat. And the, the writer of Chronicles is giving us a, a good background. Jehoshaphat was the son of... Um, Oh, I just went blank. Asa, I believe, yes, of Asa. And Asa was a good king. Now remember, this is in the time when Israel was divided. We call the northern ten tribes Israel, the southern two tribes Judah. But again, still often in Scripture, Judah is referred to as Israel, and Israel is referred to as Israel. So you, you kind of have to follow the narrative and, and realize who is being spoken about at this time. 
So Jehoshaphat was actually the king of what's considered Judah, the two southern tribes. Um, but again, it's referring to him as Israel, or to them as Israel, and so we will consider that as well. And what I want to do is I understand this narrative. I know it's written about Israel or about Judah um, in particular. But again, I want to try and bring some um, application from it to us and to America today. And so in a little bit, I'm going to paraphrase some verses. I'm going to try to um, see the correlation between the two. So if you would, give me that liberty this morning and um, work with me on that. But in Israel's past, during the time of Jehoshaphat and Israel, we see that they walked right. You know what? They were doing what they were supposed to do. They were seeking after God. They wanted to follow God with their whole heart. And they wanted to learn and they wanted to know the scripture and, and they wanted to, to follow after him. As I said, their heart was right to the point that Jehoshaphat was sending out priests and teachers and and different individuals that were learned in the scripture so that he could teach the people. You know, he wasn't satisfied with just having the knowledge and keeping it to himself. He wanted to share that knowledge and he wanted to get it out to the people because he realized that, yeah, it was helpful to him individually, but he wanted to be a help and a blessing to his nation. And he wanted the people to understand because he wanted them to also be blessed by God. And so all of the things that Jehoshaphat was doing, it was to be a help and a blessing and encouragement to his people. And so God prospered Israel and he gave them peace when their focus was on him. We see that as they were doing all of these things, the result was that the other nations around them said, you know what, we're not going to mess with Israel. As a, as a matter of fact, we're going to send them presents because we don't want them to mess with us either. And so we're going to send them gold and silver and cattle and all these different livestock because we want to be in their favor and not to hurt them and vice versa. And so God was blessing them and God prospered them and brought to them the abundance that they enjoyed. And so God used this, God used their actions as a means of blessing them. Now let me kind of paraphrase this for America. And the Lord was with America because she walked in the ways of Scripture and sought not unto the ungodly, but sought to the Lord God of her father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of the ungodly. Therefore the Lord established the nation and the other nations made peace with America. And she had riches and honor and abundance and her heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord and she took away the evil out of the nation. Also in the past, she sent to the people missionaries, evangelists, pastors, teachers to teach in the cities of America. And they taught in America and had the book of the law of the Lord with them and went about throughout all the cities of America teaching the people. And the fear of the Lord fell upon the other nations of the world that were round about America so that they made no war against America. And you know, and that was the case until 2011, right? 9-11. Oh, not 2011. 9-11. You know, America had a presence. America, all the other nations realized, you know what? America is great. America is powerful. And yes, we were engaged in different wars, but it was always to help another country. It was never on our soil, again, until 9-11. And things have been changing slowly or had changed slowly up until that point, and they continue to change, unfortunately. But just like Jehoshaphat and Israel, there was a time when America truly walked right. And you know what? There's still a remnant. There are still those that do. But as a nation, there was a time when America walked right. There was a time when America was seeking after God. There was a time when America followed God as a whole with their heart. There was a time when the leaders of America truly loved God and wanted the best for this nation and wanted to do the things according to God's principles. There was a time when America's heart was right. There was a time when America was sending missionaries to foreign countries and starting churches in America. But we don't quite see that so much today. More churches are closing their doors today than new churches are being started. Less and less missionaries are going out to 
you to in America and around the world than ever before. And even the missionaries that are going, yet you know, they are finding it more and more difficult to raise the support to even get out to go to where they feel that God is calling them. And so we are falling into a pattern. We are falling into the same past that Israel had. God prospers the nation and gives the people peace when their focus is on Him. But prosperity has caused, they, it caused a problem for Israel, and it's also going to cause a problem for America. If you would look at verse 12 and 13 of chapter 17. It says, And Jehoshaphat waxed great exceedingly, and he built in Judah castles and cities of store, and he had much business in the cities of Judah, and the men of war, mighty men of valor, were in Jerusalem. All right, so Joshua, everything was going great. He was, God was blessing. There's not a problem there. But look over to chapter 18 and verse 1 through 3. It says, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honor and abundance. All right, again, there's nothing wrong with that. But the next statement, and joined affinity with Ahab. And we'll come back to that in just a second. And after certain years, he went down to Ahab to Samaria. And Ahab killed sheep and oxen for him in abundance and for the people that he had with him and persuaded him to go up with him to Ramoth Gilead. And Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, wilt thou go up with me to Ramoth Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. Okay, if you remember from your, your Bible study, the king of Israel at this time was Ahab. Ahab's wife was Jezebel. Their daughter was Athaliah. All right? Ahab and Jezebel probably, in my opinion at least, were probably the most wicked rulers of the ten tribes ever. Of all of the kings and queens, they were, if they weren't the most wicked, they were in the top two or three. All right, so they were very, very wicked individuals. Um, if you remember, Ahab was the one that killed um, the vineyard dresser, and, you know, the Patch the Pirate has a little song about him, the, the Poochie Lip Disease and all of that. Um, and, you know, he, he was sad because he couldn't get what he wanted. And his wife said, well, I got a way for it. Go kill him and just take it. All right? That was their mindset. Okay? They, if they wanted it, they just went and took it. And if they couldn't, they'd kill or do whatever they had to destroy in order to get it. Okay? It reminds me of some folks in America today as well, if you think about, your, about the news. All right? But... Um, when in verse 1, when it says that he joined affinity with Ahab, it means they made it a, a treaty with each other through the marriage of their children. All right, so Jehoshaphat um, went through the process of getting his son to marry their daughter so that they could have a peace treaty among them. Now, you know, the problem with that was that was God blessing Jehoshaphat already? Yes, he was. Was there peace in Judah? Yes, there was. Did he need to have this peace agreement? And did he need to have affinity with Ahab and Israel? No. He didn't need that. He did that on his own. And, you know, so often as believers, you know, we're serving God. We're seeking God. We're um, trying to do all that we can to live for Him. God's blessing us. But then we look around and we say, you know, I bet if I form an agreement over here, or I bet if I got compromised over here, I could have even more influence, and I could even be, a, you know, be more well-known, or I could help more people by having an affinity or an agreement, a compromise with other people or other organizations. And yet, you know what, we, it, it, it backfires, and we're going to see that in just a little bit. You know what, we need to do what's right, and God will bless that. And God will use us to the, to the degree that He chooses to. Because again, God is sovereign. And so Ahab forms this affinity, this agreement with them. Then he goes to visit Ahab. And Ahab says, you know what? We're going to go to battle. Would you go with us? And Ahab sa or, um, Jehoshaphat says, I am as thou art. My people is thy people. We will be with thee in the war. And so just like... Um, so Jehoshaphat's problem was his pride. 
He got to a point where he realized, you know what, I, I, can, I can start making decisions on my own. I can start doing things, you know, all by myself. You know, he caused his son to marry Athaliah and to join that agreement. We'll find in a little bit, he didn't listen to godly counsel. You know, when he was confronted with truth, he said, no, you know what, I'm just going to set that aside because I don't really need to hear that right now. Through, um, he thought that his situation, we'll see in a little bit, was different and that he didn't, do, you know, that, he, that his circumstances were going to be different than everybody else's. All right, so these are some things we're going to look at here um, in just a second. But let me, let me come back and correlate this to America just for a moment. And it says, in America, or paraphrasing, in America waxed great exceedingly, and they built in America fortresses and great cities. And they had much business in the cities of America, and the men of war, mighty men of valor, were in the nation. Now America had riches and honor and abundance, and joined into close, intimate relationships with the ungodly. And the ungodly said unto America, Wilt thou join forces together with us? And she answered, We are as thou art, and our people as thy people and we will be with thee. You know, and America is following in the same footsteps. Our problem is that as a nation, our prosperity has resulted in pride. And we feel that because we are a great nation, and we feel that because God has blessed us for 230-some years now, that, you know what, we don't, have to, we don't have to follow the same principles that our founding forefathers did. You know what, we can stray away from those things. We can do what we want to do. We can make our own policy. We can set um, up the laws that we want. We can do all these things. And you know what, God's still going to bless us because He always has. But you know what, it hasn't worked for other nations in the past. And it's not going to work for America either. As a nation, we've taken prayer out of our public schools. We've taken Christ out of our government to where you can't even pray in Christ Jesus' name anymore. We've legalized abortion. We've blurred the gender distinctions. We've endorsed an entitlement mentality. We've adopted situational ethics, and we've promoted tolerance for all. You know what, if you go back and study our founding fathers and the, the, the original colonies, they didn't have tolerance for everybody. They didn't. You know what, and there are many countries in the world today that are not tolerant of everybody either. You know, when you go to live in their country, they say, this is what we stand for, this is what we believe, either live by it, or you're going to go to prison, or get out. That's the way they operate. And America, yes, we want to be, you know, the Statue of Liberty, we want to be the, the gate for, for the world and for people to come in. But we've gotten to the point where we are tolerant of anybody and everybody, and we want to try to just smooth everything over, and, you know, everybody's okay, and no matter what you believe, it's okay, and no matter what you think, it's okay, to the point where we have no right or wrong, or very little right or wrong anymore. You know, and if it, if it makes you happy, then it's okay, and if it makes me happy, that's okay, but, you know, if you do something that doesn't make them happy, well... You know, it's, it, as long as you're happy, that's okay, because then they just need to move on or whatever. And, and, and so we have a problem. That's not the way it was from the beginning. In 1963, when prayer was taken out of the um, public schools, we've seen such a dramatic shift in our country. And whether it was specifically because prayer was taken out of school, I, I guess we, we never will we'll know for sure. But it's just interesting, the statistics of what have transpired since that, was, um, since that did take place. For example, just a few things here. Um, prior to 1963, for girls 15 through 19, there were only 15 pregnancies per thousand recorded. In the 15 years after 1963, for girls 15 to 19, pregnancies increased 187%. Um, for younger girls, ages 10 to 14 years, pregnancies since 1963 are up 553%. Before 1963, STDs among students were 400 per 100,000. Over the next 12 years, they rose 226%. In our families, before 1963, divorce rates had actually been declining for 15 years. After 1963, divorces increased 300% each year for the next 15 years. 
And of course, we know today one in two marriages end in divorce. Also in our family, since 1963, unmarried people living together has increased 353%. Since 1963, single-parent families with children have increased over 160 percent. In our educational system, um, of course, we all know that the SAT scores have kind of been this, the standard of measure, but from 1963, they rapidly declined for 18 consecutive years, even though the tests remain the same. Since 1963, our nation's violent crimes have increased 544 percent. Uh, again, as we all know, illegal drugs have become an uncontrollable problem. Um, the nation has been deprived of, uh, and this is an estimate that I've, I've found, but over 50 million citizens since 1973 as a result of legalized abortions. So what is America's problem? Pride. Our prosperity has resulted in pride. And when we convince ourselves that we are above the law, we make decisions, we pass laws that are against God and combine forces with the ungodly. And we've, we've seen that, unfortunately, in the past week with several of our um, Supreme Court decisions. And you know what? We may not like it. We may not agree with it. But, again, who is in control? God is. God knew what decision they were going to make. God sees the, the end result of it all. I'm not really preaching on Ahab this morning, but one of the key factors in this whole story is that the, the whole reason, or well, maybe not the whole reason, but, but part of the reason that Jehoshaphat ended up, or that God allowed Jehoshaphat to go into an alliance with Ahab and for him to go meet with him and go through all of this was we see in chapter um, 19 or 18 that God was orchestrating all of this for one major reason and that was to kill or to have Ahab killed and, and so you know from our perspective as you're reading or from their perspective you're looking at that going you know what this doesn't make sense I don't understand this you know why is our great king going joining affinity with Ahab and why are we doing this and I'm sure that the soldiers were thinking why are we fighting with them and you know we don't have anything in common with them and all of this but God was overseeing all of it saying you know what this wicked king needs to die and I'm going to use this whole scenario to bring about his death second Corinthians chapter 6 14 through 18 Paul tells us to be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He says, For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and I will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord. Isaiah 52, 11, he says, Depart ye, depart ye, go you not out from thence, touch no unclean thing. Go you out of the midst of her, be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. As godly individuals, we are to be in, but not of the world. You know, so many of our founding fathers as we as we really go back and look, you know, we might not, you know, they might not have showed evidence of of salvation as we understand it today, but they were at least theist. You know, they at least believed in in God. They believed in the principles of God's word, and they might not have accepted Christ. And you know, some of them maybe we're not so sure about, but but we do know that that at least they realized that the, the principles of God's Word need it to be followed. And that they realized, you know what, and again, I use the word godly there as, as someone that did right, someone that was really moral, someone that um, wanted to, you know, they, they weren't um, against the things of God. And so at least the godly individuals that we look at in our history were in the world, but they weren't of the world. And at least they were showing forth the, the, the premises and the principles of God's Word. 
and showing forth the salt and the light. And of course, as believers, we know that, that we are to do that. As Christians, we know that we are the salt, that we are the light of the world. And that Christ is working through us, the Holy Spirit is working through us, so that we can minister, so that we can help others see the truth around us. Not only does prosperity result in pride, though, but then our pride distorts our perspective. If you look at verses 5 through 7 of chapter 17, actually that's 18, um, it says, Therefore the king of Israel gathered together of prophets 400 men and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him, for he never prophesies good unto me, but always evil, the same as Micaiah the son of Imla. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. All right, so what's going on here? You know, they called, and again, the custom of the kings was to call their prophets and you know, hey, should we go to battle? Is God in this? And so um, Ahab calls his prophets, which, of course, they're just going to tell the king what, he, what they know he wants them to hear. So he calls them in, and they all say, go up to the battle. You're going to do great. You know, everything's wonderful, and you're the man, and, you know, don't have any problems. Don't, don't worry about it at all. Well, Jehoshaphat, I think, saw through it, and he says, hey, don't, isn't, isn't there at least one true prophet? And it's so hilarious. Ahab's response is, yeah, there's one of them, but I don't like him. Matter of fact, I hate the guy. <laughs> All right, why do you hate him? Well, because he always prophesies evil against me. All right, well, you know what? Think about that for a minute. If, if, <laughs> if, you ask, <laughs> if you ask 10 people something about yourself and they all say the same thing, who do you think's not believing the truth? All right, the 10 people or yourself, all right, chances are it's yourself, all right? So you really need to look at that. And just by sidebar here, you know what, when, when different people are trying to help you and bringing things to your attention, instead of just going, oh, no, I don't believe that, no, I don't believe that, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you know what, you really need to consider those things and, and take the criticism and ask yourself, you know, is there something to this? I mean, I, I've been teaching the, in the school for 23 years, and I've had students come to me. I had a young man years and years and years ago, a um, 16-year-old boy, and this was a long, long time ago, but, you know, he noticed, back then it was like 1990, um, but, you know, I used to, I lived in the apartment, some apartments down Hope Mills Road, and a lot of mornings, if I was in a hurry, I'd cut through the Burger King parking lot. All right, the light turns red, because it wasn't the yellow flashing light, it would turn red, and you'd sit there for a long, long time, all right? Because remember, the, the, the red light system in Fayetteville well, wasn't that good back then, all right? So you just sit there. So a lot of times I turn in the Burger King parking lot, cut through, and come on to work. Well, he lived on Hope Mills Road, too, and they would follow, often they would see me coming to work in the morning. And so one day after class, he came to me, and he said, you know, Dr. Wilson, I'd like to ask or um, sp speak to you. And I said, that's fine. And he said, I noticed sometimes you cut through the parking lot, and he said, that really offends me. Because he said, you know, I, I don't really think that's right, and, you know, you need to sit at the light and wait for it to turn green and whatever. And he went through his, his reasons why. And I, I said, you know, thank you very much, David. I appreciate that. Um, you know, and I will take that under consideration. And so, <laughs> so he left. And, you know, I, you know, the room's empty, and I sat down at my desk, and I thought, you know what, who does he think he is? <laughs> you know, here's a 16-year-old kid telling me, I was only 23 at the time, but, you know, telling me, you know, how I should drive and what's right and not right. And I went so far, we had a deputy in the church at the time, I went so far as to call him, and I said, his name was David also, and I said, David, is it illegal to cut through a parking lot? And he said, no, you know, he said, at this time it's not unless they have a sign posted that says, you know, no cut through or whatever. He said, you know, you can do that. You know, so in my mind, I'm thinking, ha, I'm right, he's wrong, I don't need to listen to him. <laughs> but you know what? The Holy Spirit convicted me of that. And as I thought about it more and as I prayed about it, I realized, you know what? 
if I'm doing something that offends this young man, this young brother in Christ, how hard would it be for me to change? You know, leave, leave my apartment two, three minutes earlier in the morning so if I cut caught at the red light, you know, I'll just sit and wait. It's really not that big of a deal. And so sometimes we look at, we hear the criticism and we have to allow it to come into our hearts and into our minds and think through it and ponder through those things and then realize, you know what, I do need to change. I do need to be different. But, you know, there are other times when you're criticized and you, you, you take it, you pray about it, and sometimes, you know, the Holy Spirit's going to say, you know what, you are right and they are wrong. And so you just go on about your business. And, and so that is up to, that, that's between us and the Lord and the Holy Spirit. But we must realize that, um, we must realize here as um, that the Jehoshaphat or the Ahab missed, was that he was wrong. And that, you know, he, he never, the reason that he was, that was always evil was because he never did right. And, and so we need to keep that in perspective. Um, there in verse 5 through 7, it's interesting that, you know, they called Micaiah, the, the good prophet, they called him evil, and then they called all the false prophets good. They had it totally twisted. They had it all messed up. And so often we do that in our lives as well. We call good evil and evil good. We call those that are trying to do right bad, and we try to th call those that are doing bad okay, or, you know, and, well, they're just temperate, and, you know, they're, you know, and, and, but we mess up. We're great at rationalizing sin, and we're great at blaming other people. And that in our lives needs to stop. You know, because all of us are great at rationalizing. We're great ever since Adam and Eve. You know, we're good at pointing fingers at other people. We got that, that down pretty well. But we've got to start pointing the fingers back at ourselves and realizing, you know what, part of the problem in America is not the president, it's not Congress, it's not our legislators, but it's, it's us, it's me. You know what, we need more Christians like Dick Button that are willing to run for government. You know, there was a time in history that we did have Christians, we did have godly people in positions of government and in our court systems. And, and don't take me wrong, I know we still do, but they were much greater. They, we had much greater influence and a much greater presence. And you know, what happened, and what happened was that, you know, politicians started getting a bad name. You know, and everybody, oh, if you were a politician, you were automatically corrupt and you were automatically evil and all of these other things. And so as a whole, Christians backed away from that. And, the, oh, I don't want to be considered evil. I don't want to be considered corrupt. So we'll just leave and we'll, we'll kind of form our own little bubbles and our own little islands um, in and of themselves. And, you know, we'll leave government to others. And so what we have done as Christians is we've given the government to those that don't believe, like we do. And I'm not going to call them ungodly, but in the, in the scriptural sense here, we would say we've turned it over to the ungodly. And so now we, you know, now we sit back and we complain about the politicians and our, our justices and the court system and all these other things that are unfair and they're not right and you know, all the problems that we have with that. But one of the major problems is that as believers, we've stepped away from that. And so now we need to make up time and we need more individuals that are willing to run for these offices and to get involved and to make a difference in government, in court, for God. In chapter 18, verse 29, it says the king of Israel, this was after they had planned all their battles and they were getting ready to go out now. The king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, I will disguise myself and will go to the battle, but you, you put on your robes. So the king of Israel disguised himself and they went out to the battle. Now, if you know anything about the ancient battles and, and war, the enemies of the, the two opposing armies, who, do, who, was, who were they trying to kill first or as soon as they could? The leader, whether it was the king or the general or whoever, because they knew if they could kill the king, the general, that the rest of the men would pretty much fall apart because they didn't have a leader. And it would pretty much deteriorate pretty quickly and they would get the victory. 
All right, so um, in chapter, in verse 30, it says, The king of Syria had commanded the captains of the chariots that were with him. And he says, Don't fight against anybody, small or great, only the king of Israel. All right, so that was the battle plan. The battle plan for the Syrians was, Go kill the king of Israel. Don't fight anybody else. Just kind of knock them aside. Go for the king of Israel. So what happens, and, and you know, again, you, we're sure Jehoshaphat knows this. All right, he's not ignorant. He knows what the battle plans are. And yet, when the king of Israel, Ahab, says, you know what, I'm going to disguise myself and pretend like I'm just a common soldier, you dress up and go to battle, he, something should have clicked in his head there. He should have realized that there was a problem. But what happened? He thought his case was different. He thought, you know what, it won't happen to me. I'm the king of Judah. I'm Jehoshaphat. God's blessed me. God's blessed my people. You know what? God's blessing and his hands upon me, and I'll be okay. And so he agreed to this ridiculous plan. And what we fail to realize often is that Satan disguises himself in many forums, and he sets us up for failure. And then when we do fail, you know what? He thinks it's funny because he's, you know, in his mind, he's defeated us. And so Jehoshaphat succumbed to this pride distorting his perspective, thinking that he was different and that, you know, he would get by. And yet he didn't get by, or, or he sort of got by, maybe we should say, because we see in verse 31 that it did come to pass when the captains of the chariots saw Jehoshaphat that they said, it is the king of Israel. Therefore they compassed about him to fight. But it says Jehoshaphat cried out, and the Lord helped him, and God moved them to depart from him. For it came to pass that when the captains of the chariots perceived that it was not the king of Israel, they turned back again from pursuing him. And so God did choose, and I say that very specifically, because God was under no obligation to help Jehoshaphat at this point. Okay, Jehoshaphat chose to do what he did, but God in his mercy also chose to hear Jehoshaphat's cry. You know, Josh Jehoshaphat still had the, the, his wits about him enough to cry out to the Lord and to cry for help. And God heard him, God helped him, and then he handled the problem almost in a miraculous way. Because it says there that um, the Lord moved them to depart from him. Somehow or another, he caused those men to, to realize, you know what, hey, this isn't, you know, the king of Israel, so we'll leave him alone. And so they left. And so God in his goodness worked in a very mysterious way. But his judgment, verse 33, says a certain man drew a bow at a venture. So here's this guy in the back lines. He's a nobody. You know, he's just the archer, you know, one arrow, fling, okay, next, you know, and he's just sitting there flinging his arrows one after the other. You know, he's not pointing at anybody in particular, just volleying him over. But this certain man just draw, draws his bow, and he smote the king of Israel between the joints of the harness. And therefore he said to the chariot man, Turn thine hand, that thou mayest carry me out of the host, for I am wounded. And so we see the justice of God is pure, it's sure, and it's true. God is going to accomplish his will one way or the other. So, let's apply some of these things to ourselves. First of all, let's remember our past. Do you remember what your life was like before Christ changed you? Has Christ changed you? Are you a new creature in Christ? If so, your, your mindset will be different, your thoughts will be different, your actions will be different. Has there been a time when you've repented of your sin and turned to God for salvation? Renounce your pride. God loves humility, but he hates pride. And throughout Scripture, we see pride being condemned over and over again. And in order to live a victorious Christian life, we have got to learn to humble ourselves. Because if you don't humble yourself, God will humble you. Scripture says that one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess to the glory of God the Father. And that's just not Christians, that's everybody. So we can humble ourselves now, or God will humble us later. 
but ultimately we will humble ourselves. Life is not about me, it's all about Him. And so we've got to keep that in perspective. Number three, pray for your nation. And again, Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people, and I know he was speaking to Israel here, but again, we can apply this to us today and to any nation. But if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will hear it heal their land. We need to pray for our nation. Nehemiah, before, um, before he went out to build the walls of Jerusalem, if you remember back to when Pastor Sean preached through the series of Nehemiah, Nehemiah went out and not only did he confess his sin, but he confessed the sins of the nation. And he felt that burden upon him and realized, you know what? Yes, I'm just one of many in the nation, but the nation... He, he took the burden of the nation upon him and upon his shoulders, and then he prayed for them and confessed their sin as well. And then f fourthly, finally, keep the proper perspective. We are just vessels that God chooses to use. God doesn't, he doesn't need us. You know, our life, we are alive because he chooses to give us breath. We can be vessels to honor or vessels to dishonor. And you know what? None of us are perfect. And sometimes we do dishonor the Lord, just as really and truly as Jehoshaphat did here in, what, in the choices he made. But his story didn't end there. And if you come back tonight in chapters 19 and 20, we'll see how God purged him. And we'll see how that God tested him over again and how he passed the second time. And so often in our lives, you know what, when we fail the first time, God's going to bring something back into our lives again until we learn the lesson, until we can move forward, until he can mature us. Because his goal is to what? Conform us to the image of Christ and to make us more like him. God's desire is for us to be a vessel fit for the master's use. But you know what, we're, we can't do that until we give our hurts, our past hurts to God. And realize that, you know what, God doesn't owe us any explanations for the past. You know, why did I suffer this? Why was I born into this family? Why did my parents this and that and the other? And all of those things in our past. You know, sometimes we might understand, sometimes we don't. But all of those past hurts we need to set behind us and say, you know what, God? I'm just going to set them aside because you know best. Because you are sovereign. And you have a plan that I can't see. And so let me rely upon you. Let me just put my full faith and trust and confidence in you. And so as we wrap it up this morning, has the grace of God changed your life? Has the grace of God changed your life for your salvation, for your sanctification, for your daily life? Are you trusting in him and him alone just day after day after day? Has his grace changed you? And let's bow for a moment.